magma and lava. So you've probably heard of magma and lava before in your life. Maybe you've played a game that had lava in it or something, or magma. The only difference between magma and lava is where they are on Earth. Are they underground? If so, they are called magma. So magma is liquid rock that is underground. Lava is basically just magma that's made it to Earth's surface. So theoretically, if you had a giant mine and you digged down in that mine, an open pit mine, until you hit magma, then it would no longer be magma. It would actually be lava at that point. So uh, it's just how we set it as humans determines what we call it. Um, here's two words that you may not have known before, extrusive and intrusive. Now, extrusive is probably a more common word. You know, you might have heard of the word extrude because there's some plastics that are extruded. Um, sometimes metals are extruded like in a 3D printer. But when it talk, comes to volcanoes in the earth, when we talk about extrusive, we mean magma that has made its way to the surface and become lava. So it's extruded out of the earth, really. So there's a picture right there, what extrusive igneous rocks look like uh, when they're being formed. And then obviously the opposite of extrusive is intrusive, meaning it stayed underground. It intruded into the earth, but never left it. So that would be something like magma or a volcano, but the, the magma never made it quite to the surface. Those would be intrusive rocks. Um, as far as what are most rocks on earth, most igneous rocks on earth are actually intrusive. Very few actually make it to the surface. So uh, for example, Pikes Peak, if anyone's been to Colorado, the entire mountain on Pike Peak is intrusive. Um, Yosemite National Park, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Uh, a lot of their mountains in Yosemite are intrusive igneous rocks. They're made of granite, really. So most rocks on Earth are intrusive when it comes to igneous rocks. Just That's just extra information. You won't see that in a quiz or anything, but figured you might want to know that. Um, very few actually make it to the surface. All right, this isn't a chat question, but um, let's say you were thinking about, okay, volcanoes. What, what would make a volcano explode? Two things affect the explosiveness of a volcano or non-explosiveness of a volcano. And here they are. So more silica and dissolved gases. Now, first, let me talk about silica. The other thing that leads to explosive volcano is, well, you got to have something that pushes. You have to have something that makes it go boom. And that would be dissolved gases. So dissolved gases, you, we're going to see them more on the next slide. So you don't have to write them down for right now. But water, you might not think of water as something that makes something explode. But if you heat water up, boil it, which volcanoes definitely have enough heat to do that, water becomes steam. And steam definitely can push things out of the way. So can carbon dioxide. But uh, if you don't have one of these things, like let's say you have a lot of dissolved gases, but you don't have silica. Well, if you don't have silica making the lava and the magma more thick, the dissolved gases will just flow out of the lava easily. If you have silica but no gases, then nothing happens because the volcano doesn't go boom. It just sits underground and gets stuck. So you have to have both of these to get an explosive volcano. If you have one or the other, it doesn't. This one is like Hawaii. It just kind of oozes out. And then this one, you never have a volcano in the first place. It stays underground if you have too much silica. Uh, so... That's what it looks like if you have dissolved gases. So that's actually a lava rock from Hawaii right there. You can see these nice bubbles in it. And here's the thing about dissolved gases. It's not just magma and lava that has, have dissolved gases. Any liquid on Earth has dissolved gases. Let's go to this slide now. So when you have dissolved gases in magma, they're called volatiles. If you have dissolved gases in water, that's how fish actually breathe oxygen. And any plant life or animal life underwater they need dissolved gases in water to actually be able to function. Any liquid contains gases. So for example, regular water contains oxygen, uh, water contains carbon dioxide. These three things right there, they're gases. They build up pressure. And if they have enough pressure built up in a magma chamber, you can get an eruption. Now, uh, there's other things inside magma. There's obviously the melted rock, the magma itself. That, you know, That's what makes up most magma chambers. But there's also solids. Uh, solids could be crystals, they could be minerals, basically things that are too strong or have too high of a melting point to be melted in the magma. And in this picture right here, you can see these little black dots. Those are crystals or minerals in a magma chamber. Now, it's not just magma that has solids. If you've ever gotten a glass of tap water or water that didn't come from like a, a bottle, 
and you held it up to the light, you probably saw those little floaty things inside there. Those are solids. Red right here. So fast rate of cooling. Many small crystals. So lava. If it cools down too fast, you've got lava because lava forms on our surface and it's exposed to the air and can cool pretty quickly. If you have large crystals like this, that means it cooled slowly underground. So this would be like magma. It could take months, it could take years, could take decades, but usually doesn't. So how slowly it cools tells you how big your crystals are gonna get. The faster it cools, the smaller the crystals, the slower it cools, the bigger the crystals. Now, texture, and let me talk about the word texture. So texture, is not what you would think when we're talking about minerals and rocks and things like that. So normally when you think of texture, like when we were in person, there's a big deal. I would hand them a rock for the test and it'd say, what, what is the texture of the rock? And they would feel the rock and they say, it's rough. No, 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 no. Obviously rocks are rough. What we're talking about is like, what is the size of the crystals? What is the shape of the crystals? What's the arrangement of them? Are they basically big or are they small? Things like that. So if you see the word texture, this one right here, that's what we kind of mean when we talk about igneous textures. So glassy, you've probably heard of obsidian before. Glassy isn't even made of minerals because it cools down so quickly, it actually doesn't have time to make minerals. And I don't think obsidian is actually even considered a rock. I think it's considered glass for that reason. As far as pyroclastic and porphyritico, like I said earlier, a mix of large and small crystals, and then a mix of large crystals and ash. Now, let's take a look at some examples of these. So for example, here is aphantic, which is small crystals. Now the way to tell whether something has small crystals and cooled quickly is if you can't see the crystals with your naked eye or really can't make out what the crystals are, then it's fast cooling. So this would be an example of a lava rock. You can't really see the crystals uh, with the naked eye, so probably cooled down pretty quickly, probably cooled down via lava. Now over here, this is a microscope view of the same rock and under a microscope you actually can see the crystals so this is a rock and it is made of minerals they're just really really small here is phaneritic rock which is slow cooling and you can make out different colors right here you can see dark black minerals you can see white minerals you can see brown minerals so they're all there and you can see them with the naked eye under a microscope phaneritic you can also see the minerals as well. You can see you can see really large ones mixed in with maybe a little bit smaller ones, but they're definitely visible with the naked eye as well. So that would be a magma. This had to have formed underground. There's no way this could have formed in a lava. The crystals would have not not would not have time to grow. Okay, next one. Porphyritic, you can see right here. Notice the very large crystals. So there's large tan. Those are called um, plagioclases. There's also a mix of smaller crystals. So these black and white ones in between these plagioclases are smaller, probably coming from a different magma chamber or maybe it made lava at that point. But a mix of really, really large crystals and small crystals is porphyritic. Obsidian, glassy, I mean, it's pretty easy to see. It looks like glass, no minerals even under a microscope. Done. Now that was texture. So texture is what is the shape and the size of the crystals. Composition is literally what are they made out of? Are they made out of silicates or are they made out of mostly non-silicates? So this is more of a module one kind of thing, um, if you remember that. And for light versus dark, um, the main difference is how many metals, how many oxides does it have? So if the minerals are pretty light, a bunch of silicates, your rock is going to be pretty light as well. So here's an example of light and dark in the same image. It started out for this ash flow as light. You can see right there, very gray, kind of like this one right here. And then over time, it turned dark. So this can happen, usually doesn't, but it can happen. But that's an example of what dark minerals look like and light minerals. Now, the main difference is how much silica does it have? Does it have a lot of silica? So things with granitic composition will have links up with plate tectonics. So granitic composition rocks are a major constituent of continental crust, the stuff that we live on. Now, it also influences something else about continental crust. Continental crust is less dense than oceanic crust. And the reason why is because of these high amounts of silica, 
Silica, pictured here, silica is less dense than most other rocks. SiO2 is not very dense. And because of that, continental crust tends to float on top of oceanic crust. It doesn't subduct, it doesn't sink, which is good because, you know, it'd be kind of bad if our continent were sinking under the ocean or something like that. People wouldn't like that. But also, uh, because of that, because continental crust contains a lot of silica, it also influences what kind of volcanoes we have. So continental crusts, lighter colored, so light like this or light like this, contains not very much metals and contains lots of silica. Because of that, it's very low density. Now, that should mean the opposite is true. So instead of granitic composition for granite, let's say a basaltic composition, also known as mafic. Now, because it's dark, that means it has more metals. It has more iron, it has more magnesium. And because of that, mafic rocks tend to be more dense. And oceanic rocks, which contain a bunch of mafic rocks, are also more dense, which is why oceanic crust sinks under continental crust. Although you guys already learned that uh, last year. So the ocean floor and many volcanic islands, including Hawaii, Iceland, most volcanic islands tend to be mafic or mostly mafic rocks. Now, the reason for that is because the oceanic floor is also made of mafic rocks. And it's also, it's also got uh, some magma from the mantle rising up and mantle magma tends to contain more metals. So that's how we link it to our, uh, our unit on plate tectonics. Now that's basaltic and granitic. You can see basaltic rock right here. This is actually a picture of Hawaii and notice how dark the rocks are. Uh, Hawaii is basically 100% basaltic rocks. 